Welcome back everyone. So a lot of people have been asking me to do a video on compression, specifically parallel compression, but also how I generally use compression with the mostly orchestral or hybrid orchestral music that I write. And I don't know why you would want to learn that from me. I'm not a mix engineer. Like I know stuff, but there are way better resources to consult for mixing stuff. That's not my main job. I'm mainly a composer. Like I've sat in on mixes and I've interned at studios at, at recording and mix studios. And you know, I've looked over enough people's shoulder to know my way around, but I'll do this video, but just know this is like with a huge disclaimer at the front because this is not my main gig. Um, if I need a theatrical surround mix, I always have someone else do that. So um, take everything I say with a grain of salt. Before I get into it, just know this is a video on dynamic compression and not on like audio quality compression, like wave to mp3. If you accidentally hear for that, that's not what this is about. So sorry. <laughs> So if you really want to get into the whole mixing thing and you really want to learn from people that actually know what they're talking about, this is one that I would definitely recommend. If you're not subscribed to this YouTube channel, this is the one that I would go to. This is my go-to. Um, it's called In The Mix. It's this guy, his name is... I have no idea what his name is. Dan? What's your name, brother? Sir, what's your name? Michael. Hi, Michael. Thank you, Michael, for teaching me so many things. Anyway, subscribe to this guy. Not that he needs more subscribers, apparently. A lot of people love this. Um, if you like my content, you're gonna love his content just because his demeanor is like he's calm, non-sensationalist, like he's not the typical YouTube personality or anything. It's just very concise, to the point and explains so well, shows everything on screen. I have not watched a single video of his where I haven't learned something and uh, he's a really good teacher. So just go to this channel, watch this guy talk. Like he knows what he's doing. Then another channel I would recommend that most people already know is Mix With The Masters. Specifically, if you go to all the score mixers that are on here that are doing all your favorite film scores, um, they do a lot of walkthroughs and a lot of really cool stuff that you can check out. Um, this I just like a little less because it's not always starting at the basics. I think uh, a lot of the videos kind of assume that you already know a lot of stuff about mixing and DAWs and all that stuff, whereas Michael's videos on the other channel are much more here's the concept here this is how you can understand this and now i'm going to demonstrate it so that you can hear the difference so it's a lot more um comprehensive in a way like he doesn't start in the middle he starts at the beginning and then explains it all the way to the end and then something another free resource that i would highly highly recommend if you go to isotopes website they have a tab at the top that's called learn and it it's endless resources. On their social media, they also usually post these little tips and tricks. So I would definitely subscribe to their Instagram and stuff. Um, it's brilliant. It's videos, but it's also um, blog entries, everything. Everything about mixing, mastering, audio cleanup. Um, of course, some of it is focused on their products, but it works for anything. It's not just their product specific stuff. It's general. Uh, really good information. You can also learn by topic down here. You can pick from from the drop down menu. If you have some of their products, you can also learn by product. I go here all the time um, when I'm in between projects and I just feel like reading up on stuff or refreshing my memory or learning something new, some new production technique that I haven't tried yet. This is one of my go-tos. So read people. Just read. It's there. They put it there for you. Just consume it. But so with all of these disclaimers and way better resources, take my word for it, let's get into compression and let me try to 
explain it as best as I can. So to understand parallel compression or all the other stuff we're going to get into, first you need to understand what is compression. A lot of people think compression makes a signal softer or louder. That's not what compression does. What it does is it reduces the dynamic range of a signal. That's all it does. I even made an ugly drawing for you. Let's get into it. <laughs> Alright, so here we go. Wow. Gorgeous. It's a masterpiece. I cannot draw a f***ing straight line to save my life. Anyway, so that's the volume. And that's gonna be time down there. Then we're gonna be drawing a waveform. Let's just assume this is, you know, the audio right there. And then we pick a threshold. So I'm putting it somewhere there so that some of the peaks are above the threshold and the main portion of the signal is below the threshold. Right there. Oh my god, it's... Just disregard my... Thank god I don't make money doing this. <laughs> That's just awful. Okay, there's our threshold. So you see some of the peaks are falling over the threshold. So what we're doing then is we pick a ratio. In this case, just for simplicity's sake, let's say we pick a ratio of 2 to 1. What this means is that all the signal that is dipping over the threshold is now reduced in volume by half. So it's not actually cut off. That would be a limiter, a brick wall limiter. We're just reducing all these peaks by half. Look at that. Okay. Now everything that is below the threshold is untouched. The compressor is not doing anything to that. It's just cutting off at the top. It does not touch the bottom. And then there are other things in every compressor that you can control. Usually one of the main functions are um, attack and release. Those two features basically say how quickly the compressor kicks in and how quickly it releases the compression. Uh, usually on something like percussion, for example, you would pick quick, um, quick attack, um, and then on something like a bass, you would usually um, choose, for example, a slower attack, or something on like strings and stuff, I would generally choose a slower attack. So if we get rid of the original signal there that we had before we had the compressor applied, this is now the new waveform that you would be getting. So now you can see that it's a bit softer overall because we've cut off the peaks and made the peaks half as loud. So we've created a lot of headroom there. So now what a lot of people would do um, is open up the gain and make the overall signal, all of it, louder because now we can. But that's not necessarily what you have to do. You can also just compress signal to um, make it overall volume a little bit softer. That's what I actually usually do. I use it to, you know, kind of push down the peaks a little bit and just even out the, uh, the, the overall dynamic range. That's what I usually use it for. I don't always use it to actually push the volume up. So this is how one compressor would work on a singular signal. Now there is First of all, there's something called serial compression. I think that's what, it, what it's called. Maybe some people call it chain compression, but it's basically when one signal runs through multiple compressors. Because if you use too much compression on a lot of instruments, you get a very ugly pumping effect or you get artifacts and you know it really starts to sound compressed and just almost sounding like destroyed audio, which is not nice. So um, some people use... Um, just multiple compressors in their signal chain, you know, in order to slowly even things out, slowly cut off, you know, bit by bit those peaks and just um, push the dynamic range together and tie the mix together um, to just kind of, you know, soften the blow in a way. Then we have my personal favorite, parallel compression. Parallel compression is um, a strange principle um, where you take the original signal that is completely uncompressed and then you take a duplicate of that signal and you heavily compress it, like you over compress it. And 
then that soft, hyper compressed, you know, wall of a signal, you slowly mix in from the bottom. So you don't touch the original signal and you just mix in this extremely compressed signal um, a little bit into the mix to kind of fatten up the sound. Um, so it's kind of a weird principle where you're actually mixing compression in from below instead of cutting off at the top and pushing down. I have it right here. I have a cue from a movie that I've done. So let me mark, let me link all of these. So these are the compressed signals and all the faders that are further up are, is the uncompressed signal, right? Let me just um, play you a section of this cue and then I'll mute and unmute the parallel compression so you can hear the difference. You can hear what it does. And then you'll probably also know why I like it so much because it sounds so natural, you know? It makes everything wider and bigger and larger than life, but it doesn't sound compressed. It feels like there's a lot of dynamic range still um, maintained because you're not touching the original signal. So let's Q-link these. And I'll move these faders up and down. Then you can also see, you know, what that does. But so first, let's play through it. So overall, it makes the signal louder, of course, but mostly it makes it fuller. And that's kind of one of the things, some compressors do that inside the compressor already, so you wouldn't have to set it up like this. I kind of like it like this because it gives me uh, control and also visuals. But so this is set up by default in my template, which you have probably seen if you watch my template videos. But this is something that I've seen a lot of mixers do. It's technically from pop music, actually. Pop and rock music and, you know, other genres. Um, works particularly well with hybrid music. But I've also heard, I've read it on VI Control when that discussion came up from mastering engineers that have worked with classical orchestral recordings that they've also been um, actually using this back in the day on classical orchestra recordings so yeah to me it's uh this alone massively improves the sound to me to be honest um so that's why i do it and it's definitely creating this hollywood larger than life sound that you know otherwise i mean i'm sure there are other ways to get that kind of sound but to me this is the simplest way of going about it and you have control over every element and how much of the parallel compression you want. The important thing here, and also any time you use compression, is that you compress the dry signal. Um, try not to compress signal with reverb already on, because then you're also compressing the reverb, and it. I can't remember that ever sounding good. I'm sure there's some instance where that sounds good, but um, I would not recommend. This is also especially nice for film music because you're competing with dialogue and sound effects. And so thickening up, fattening up the sound, um, you're gonna have a bit of an easier time for the music to be heard. Because this also evens out the, even though you have a lot of dynamics still, it evens out the loudness of the cue. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't completely dip out. And, you know, if you have a bad dub mix, 
you know, but you have a really nice even signal, then, you know, at least you still have a chance to compete with the sound effects and the dialogue and Foley and what else is going on in the movie. Um, if you create more of a carpet than you normally would. Then you have this toy. It's a multiband compressor. So it's basically, in this case, it's four compressors in one. Um, but instead of just compressing the entire signal as a whole, you can say, okay, for this, for the low frequencies, I want this type of compression. And then for the low mid frequencies, I want a different type of compression. And then the high mids, I want a different type of compression. And then for the highs, I want a different type of compression again. This is really handy if you have signal that has a lot of different elements going on in different frequency spectrums. So then you can kind of drag these where you want them to be and then give the different elements different compression. And this is generally great, I think, for drum kits or I, I like to use it for percussion a lot. I also like to use it to um, make things very loud. <laughs> if you want stuff loud, this is a great tool because you can control. It's more surgical than just, you know, an overall compressor because you can control the different frequency bands by themselves and apply the compression in a more detailed way. But if you don't feel comfortable with compression yet in general, I'd probably stay away from it for now. Um, I mean, play around with it for, you know, by all means, but um, this can get a bit confusing. If you're still struggling with just a general <laughs> compressor, then, you know, maybe this is for later. Uh, then I would say just learn general compression first and then, um, you know, parallel compression because, you know, very little can go wrong there and then dive more into these types of things. Parallel compression is also the least offensive of the bunch. So even if you use a little too much of it, it's probably fine. The only thing that I would be careful with with parallel compression is sometimes it brightens up the signal a little bit. So you might have to EQ um, at the end a little bit and dip out those like high mid frequencies. And over time, you'll get a feel for what elements can take what kind of compression. Um, you know, at what point percussion sounds too compressed, at what point it gets artifacts, at what point it sounds pumpy. Um, or you will learn that, you know, very often vocals can actually take a lot of compression in my experience. You know, it, it very much varies. Uh, it also depends on how... Um, produced you want the thing to sound or if you're going for a rather natural orchestra sound so that's just kind of something you learn over time I, th I don't think there are any um, like any guidelines on you know what instrument an instrument group can take what kind of compression because it very much also depends on how it was recorded where it was recorded with what microphones it was recorded you know, and then what the end product is supposed to be, what genre it is. So that's kind of difficult to say. So one thing, one guideline that I've seen when, uh, whenever I was assisting a mix or sitting in was if someone knew they were going to apply compression, it seemed like, let's just set these back to zero. Um, it seemed like they would apply it first just as a general to ease into it. They would apply it first to reach kind of a compression of minus 3 dB here. Just kind of as a... This doesn't mean they didn't change it later. They did. But um, just kind of as a first step into to ease into it. So it would be kind of like this. know something like that uh, just as a starting point and then they would go from there you know um, just to kind of take the edges off first 
Um, another thing you can do if you don't want the compressor to kick in so much in some of the parts, something I like to do is in Cubase, you can go into the pencil tool. I'm sure other DAWs have similar functions. And then you can actually inside the region kind of do a little bit of a gain staging in a way like this, wherever, cause I'm not a very good whistle player. I mean, it's fine, but it's not great. Um, a real whistle player would probably not have these extreme volume bumps, but so you could already, you know, even it out a little bit so that the compressor doesn't kick in so hard on wherever, you know, wherever you get louder. Um, so that's one way to ease it up a little bit too. Um, and then I usually use the gain to pick the volume relative to the rest of the piece, of course. Uh, so that's kind of determined in context. In general, anything you do in mixing is always kind of determined in context. So it's not like you can generally say, oh, do this, because it heavily depends on what everyone else is doing. It's like EQing. I want to do a video on EQing, but it's very difficult to talk about it because so much of it is context and so little of it can be put down as like a general rule. So this is just a good starting point, I think, um, that I've seen a lot of people do before they really dive in and choose different values. Of course, you also have uh, hardware compressors. I don't use any, but um, certainly a lot of mix engineers do. I've seen them used at the studios that I've worked at. Um, I've seen them also used not necessarily just as compressors, the hardware compressors, but also to get a specific color to get a specific coloring effect that specific hardware compressors have. So the engineer would listen to the singer, for example, and based on the color of their voice and the microphone they were using, they picked a specific compressor to already bake into the recording. Um, I'm not that knowledgeable, so I don't do that. But that's definitely something that is also done. Something that you may have seen in my other videos is that I do use compression to also tie things together. For example, when I do my vocals and I'm using them as kind of ethereal backing vocals in a way, and I'm trying to get a choir together, I use a lot of compression so that it doesn't sound like, you know, 20 individual singers with their different peaks and stuff. Um, but it's all kind of, you know, more, uh, tied together and you know nobody's sticking out and everything is kind of you know um, pushed together uh, that's what I use compression for as well to kind of create a more a more tied together choir sound especially if I have individuals singing and then I try to have them sound like they are you know one body of of sound there are also special tricks you can use. Um, one of them is, of course, sidechain compression. Um, I want to demonstrate it, but honestly, just go to um, in the mix um, and watch how he's doing it, because uh, he explains it way better than I do. But the general concept is, for example, in film music, much like in uh, pop and rock music, very often we have big percussion going on big hits but also if you know fat synth bass or you know a lot of other low end going on and so both of these cannot easily coexist because they're taking up the f the same frequency spectrum and they just don't there's a lot of build up very quickly a lot of energy down there um, and so only one of them can exist at any given time and so in order to make room for the big percussion hits you sidechain a compressor to the bass, and then the compressor only reacts to the input that is coming from the percussion. So every time there's a big percussion hit, the um, sidechained compressor is going to duck down the, um, the synth bass, or electric bass, or whatever you have going on there, to make room for the hit. And the moment the hit is done, the compressor goes back up and doesn't do anything. So this is a really cool way to make room for, you know, big percussive hits. They do that a lot in trailer music, for example, but, you know, any action cues you may have, 
um, where that is conflicting, this is a great way to make room for another element that sits in the same frequency range. It's kind of almost the equivalent of saying every time there's a big percussion hit, I'm going to drag the volume down on the other instrument that sits there. But so you can just sidechain a compressor to basically do that, to just dip it down every time there's a big hit. Um, and you can do that with other elements too. If there are conflicting elements in the same frequency range, you can just say, well, whenever this is there, I want this other thing to dip out. And so that's what you can use, use a sidechain compressor for. Most compressors are able to sidechain. I'm not sure if there is one that can't do that. And then another thing that you can also see on the In The Mix channel, again, go there to watch that because I learned it from there. So why would I just repeat what he's saying? Um, he shows some more tricks um, around only having the compressor react to a certain frequency range, to not have it react to the low frequencies because there's so much pileup down there and so much energy down there um, that sometimes you don't want your compressor to kick in already um, when there's really only all that low frequency filling it up. So he has a really great uh, video about um, filtered compression or how to get the compressor to only react to certain frequencies instead of the full frequency spectrum and to kind of have the um, compression that way be more natural and um, just sound softer. But yeah, go to his channel and watch it there because he's great. He explains it really well. In fact, just go to him. Just don't listen to me. Just go to him and listen to him. Do that. But so I hope this was helpful um, at all. Uh, it's, it's such a tricky topic to talk about because it's so situational with every single cue and every single piece. But I think um, maybe I managed to kind of demystify at least some portion of it. Um, but, you know, go to other people that know more about this to really learn about it. And at the end of the day, just use your ears and play around with it. Try and figure out what works for you. Uh, read around, watch a lot of YouTube videos, go to that Isotope website, read about how other people, how real engineers do this and they have all the tricks in the world and it's all out there for free. So you can learn all this for free. Um, so go learn something. <laughs> <laughs>